now we're going to put together all the pieces of everything we've learned up to this point. Um, we have a source, which we understand. We have a load, of course, connected to a transmission line, source connected to a transmission line, and we have an interface between two dissimilar transmission lines. And so we have everything in the circuit. There are, are no unknowns. <clears throat> we have the source, a transmission line characteristic impedance, a second transmission line characteristic impedance, the load, we know the impedance, we know the electrical length of each transmission line, which turns out to be uh, lambda over four uh, in this case. So the question then becomes, uh, what is the uh, current and voltage at the end of this line? What is IL and VL? So how do we determine this? And you might have uh, a little bit of angst, a little bit of stress uh, thinking about how we might determine it. You might go through and look through your notes and look for a blue box equation that might tell you VL and IL for this particular circuit. And let me assure you, there is none. Uh, you can look till the cows come home and there isn't any answer, an equation that's going to give you this result. And this is the essence of engineering. Um, if, uh, if there was an equation that uh, solved every problem you faced, then uh, you wouldn't get very much money because uh, uh, we can get we can hire computers or get computers to to calculate numbers what we need with engineers is to solve equations or solve problems rather uh, where we don't know the answer we don't have the equation we apply the knowledge that we've obtained to systematically step through and get the right uh, result and that's what we need to do here and you do know enough we have all the pieces now in the toolbox uh, to be able to apply them to determine the values of VL and IL Trust in your knowledge, trust in your electrical engineering uh, toolbox, and you can go through systematically and determine the answer to this problem. Again, we have device equations, which include uh, source and load and the uh, telegrapher equations. And of course, the boundary conditions are associated with both KCL and KVL. And that's really all the knowledge that's required to determine the solution. What you need to do, though, and this is something that... Um, you know, I, I, I tell students and and, uh, and uh, really uh, encourage them to think about as they go through and solve these problems. To get to the right answer, you have to be patient. Again, there isn't any blue box equation. There isn't one line where you can write VL and IL and, and um, do a few um, uh, numerical calculations and get the result. You have to go through the process um, uh, slowly and patiently to get the end. This is very much like uh, uh, solving a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku pro, uh, problem. You have to go through and just do it one step at a time. Uh, one uh, statement will lead to the next uh, statement, and which will lead to the next, and you just need to uh, not get impatient to try to jump to the end. Uh, <clears throat> you need to be persistent and uh, keep going. It may be a situation where you're not sure where to go, but keep at it and try to figure out what, uh, now that I know this, what else can I uh, now determine? I need to be precise um, and go through and not be sloppy and say, oh, well, uh, I think this is probably this, or it seems like it could be that. Uh, you really need to make sure that to, you unambiguously apply your knowledge and uh, do it in a way that's uh, sort of mathematical and is proof, that it's uh, unimpeachable with respect to the uh, knowledge or logic that you imply. And then finally, be professional in your effort. And to a certain extent, professionalism is uh, uh, includes these uh, other three attributes, uh, patience, persistence, and, and precision. Um, if you do that, you're uh, producing a professional work. And so I call these the four Ps, patience, persistence, precision, and professionalism. Um, and that's what you need to do to be able to get the right answer. If you lack on either one of these, any of these form, uh, then you're probably not going to get the correct answer. Now, this seems maybe daunting, but it's not that hard. Um, and it is uh, a skill, a, um, uh, a uh, um, an outset or mindset, rather, uh, that you need to develop to be successful as an electrical engineer. So I tell students in these problems, and any problem, don't try to figure out what the um, problem is asking you to determine. Don't start with the end in mind. Just start with what you now know and what else can you determine from that. Just start at the beginning and slowly go, this is the knowledge I have, and put those pieces together and they will lead uh, to the answer. Again, very much like a jigsaw puzzle, a crossword puzzle, Sudoku. Uh, you just start with what you have and try to build on that. So what do we know? Well, from the standpoint of the first transmission line, we know from the telegrapher equations that the total voltage is equal to this. 
this, and the total current is equal to this. Now this is for the region between z is equal to minus lambda over 4 to z is equal to 0. Notice I've written an index now that's increasing as we move to left and right, which is usual. I've set the index at this location of the transition at the interface to be z is equal to 0. Each transmission line is a quarter wavelength, and so this index is denoted by the value z is equal to minus lambda over 4, and this index is denoted as the uh, value of lambda plus lambda over 4. Likewise, we can, from the telegrapher equation solutions, determine the total voltage and total current on this right side of the circuit, the second transmission line. And here we have uh, two complex um, wave amplitudes, unknown complex wave amplitudes, two complex numbers, and they're uh, V plus and V minus, and we denote them as um, uh, V0 plus and V0 minus, I denote them with the uh, subscript B uh, 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 that um, denotes the second transmission line, transmission line A and transmission line B. Again, this is val valid only over the domain between Z is equal to zero to plus lambda over four. Over this index, will this equation have any meaning? Now, <clears throat> Excuse me, now we're going to apply boundary conditions. And of course to do that we need to know the current and voltage, the total current, the total voltage, at each end of each of our transmission lines. So we need to find uh, VA here uh, and IA here. Likewise VA and IA at the other end of the line. Uh, VB, and, VB and IB uh, begin the second line and finally the uh, VB and I. <clears throat> VB and IB at this end. So there's going to be um, a total of four voltages here, 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 and here, and four currents again here, 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 and here. And from those we can apply boundary conditions. So let's go to the beginning here at the index Z is equal to minus lambda over four. And first we find the total voltage at the beginning of this transmission line. We simply take the index and insert it into the telegrapher equation solution for total voltage. And we do that again carefully evaluating the complex exponentials and we get this value for the total voltage at the beginning of transmission line A. We likewise do the same thing for total current. Take our total current expression and evaluate it at z is equal to minus lambda over 4. Carefully evaluate our complex exponentials and this becomes the result for the current at the beginning of the line. Of course it's in terms of the unknown wave amplitudes v0 plus for a and v0 minus for a. Now we are excited to be able to apply boundary conditions at this first interface. And so we have an equation that describes our source, and we've talked about this before. We have our open circuit voltage minus the voltage drop across this 50 ohm resistor will be equal to the voltage here at the beginning of the line. And that's expressed by this equation here. J17 is the open circuit voltage. <clears throat> And that's equal to the voltage at the beginning of the line plus the voltage drop across this resistor, 50 ohm resistor. And the current through that 50 ohm resistor by KCL is the current here at the beginning of the line. Of course, we know what the total voltage is at the beginning of the line at Z is equal to minus lambda over 4. And so we insert it here. Likewise, for the current, we insert it here. And we come up with an equation now that includes both the unknown wave amplitude V0 plus for trans transmission line A and V0 minus for transmission line A. This is our first boundary condition. Now let's move to the other end of our transmission line, our first transmission line, and determine the uh, total current IA and total voltage VA at the location Z is equal to zero. So we take our first telegrapher equation solution for this first transmission line and evaluate it Z is equal to zero. Complex exponentials become easy to evaluate here. They're simply equal to 1, and so we get this result. The same thing for current. We evaluated Z is equal to 0, and we get this result, the total current and total voltage at this location on our transmission line. 
we repeat the process for the beginning of the second transmission line. Again, we're evaluating that Z is equal to zero, but in this case, we're inserting that value into the total voltage for the second transmission line, VB, and the total current for the second transmission line, IB. And so we insert and we get these re uh, results uh, for those two equations. Having evaluated the total current and total voltage at each end of these two transmission lines at Z is equal to zero specifically, we can now uh, apply our boundary conditions, in this case simply KVL. We know the voltage at the end of the first line must be equal to the voltage at the beginning of the second. And of course these things are directly connected together. These little wires I have connecting them are uh, arbitrarily short and therefore have no significant inductance or capacitance. Uh, effectively they are connected directly together and therefore these two voltages really describe the voltage at the same location, Z is equal to zero. Therefore they must be equal to zero are equal to each other rather and therefore this is the result a result that relates the two unknown wave amplitudes of the first transmission line to the two unknown wave amplitudes of the second we get a second boundary condition equation from this interface at z is equal to zero and we get that by applying kcl to the results for the current at the end of the first line and the current at the beginning of the second we evaluated each and we had these results but they now must be equal to each other because this current coming out is equal to this current coming in again and we're not saying that the current expression uh, across this transmission line is equal to the current expression here don't tell me that iaz is equal to vbz that is not the case in fact they're not even defined over the same domain what we're saying is this function when evaluated at this one specific point is equal to this function when evaluated at this specific point as well. By KCL, then we know these two numbers, not functions of position Z, but these two numbers are equal to each other. And from that, we extract a yet another relationship that a, um, uh, relates the two unknown wave amplitudes of the first transmission line to the two, two unknown wave amplitudes of the second. Our last boundary condition comes from our last boundary, and our last boundary here is at the end of the second transmission line, at the location of z is equal to plus lambda over 4. Again, we had a boundary condition here, z is equal to minus lambda over 4, from that we got one equation. We had a boundary condition at z is equal to 0, we had two equations result from that, and now we go to this boundary condition at z is equal to plus lambda over 4. To determine this, we go through and once again evaluate the total voltage at this location, at plus lambda over 4, insert it into our total voltage to get a number, carefully evaluate the complex exponentials, and this is our result. In addition to voltage, let's determine the total current at the end of this transmission line at z is equal to lambda over 4. We insert that into the total current expression for IB, the current on this transmission line, and carefully evaluate the complex exponentials, and we get this result. So our final boundary condition equation comes from applying Ohm's law in addition to KVL and KCL. From Ohm's law, we know the load voltage um, divided by the load re impedance is equal to the load current <clears throat> uh, or the current load current times ZL is equal to VL Ohm's law we additionally know that by KCL the current at the end of this line is equal to the current through the load and the voltage at the end of this second line is equal to the voltage across the load so we combine those pieces together this divided by this is that this must be equal to the the uh, voltage VB at the end, and this load current must be equal to the current at the end of the line as well. All right, so here's Ohm's law. From KVL, we get this. From KCL, we get this. And when we go through and reduce the equation, we find we get a fourth result that relates our unknown wave amplitudes. So let's take stock of what we've done. From that first boundary, we came up with one equation, which related V0 plus for the A to V0 minus for A. 
For the second boundary, z is equal to zero, we actually came up with two equations, resulting in the unknown wave amplitudes on one side to the unknown wave amplitudes on the other, the A wave amplitudes to the V wave amplitudes. We had one from KVL and one from KCL. And then finally, using Ohm's law and KCL and KVL, we came up with a fourth equation for our last boundary condition at the end of the second line where the load is attached. So count them, one, two, three, four equations. How many unknowns do we have? V0A plus, V0A minus, V0V plus, and V0B minus. We have four equations, we have four unknowns. If we we're mathematicians, we'd simply put down our pencil at this point because we would claim the problem was solved. But because we're engineers, we need to go through and actually determine the values of each of these four unknown values. So we have four unknowns and four equations, and one way we could solve that was insert all this into our calculators or some other uh, numerical calculating machine and get the results. And I'm not opposed to that per se, but what I find is oftentimes students, when they do that, take longer than if they simply tried to do it algebraically. And because, you know, you fat finger one number or the other, they uh, almost inevitably get the wrong answer in the end. And so I would argue simply do it algebraically, it's not that hard. And so to show, we can insert the fourth equation into the second equation and get this result. And we can solve <coughs> or these two results, and we can solve for this unknown wave amplitude, or equate, uh, uh, equate them rather, and go through and get this result here. And then we take that result and put it in the first equation, and we get one equation with one unknown, which is V0A minus. And so we can solve for V0A minus, and that turns out to be minus 7. And of course, that's not a DC value of minus 7. That is a complex number, a mag excuse me, magnitude of 7 and a phase of pi. It is has a, you know, oscillation of 7 uh, volts and a uh, phase uh, relative to zero of uh, pi radians, 180 degrees out of phase, a real part of minus seven and imaginary part of zero, in other words. So once we have one answer, it's easy to go back and insert and determine the other values, uh, in this case for V0 plus A and V0 minus A, B rather, and V0 plus B, and we get these values. And again, I emphasize, I went through and I come up with examples where the uh, answers are relatively simple mathematically. If that uh, isn't the case, it turns out that uh, we get a lot of errors. But sometimes I think that misleads students in understanding what these results mean. Again, this is not not nine volts DC. This is a, uh, uh, a complex number. It is a real value of nine and an imaginary part of zero. In other words, it is a magnitude of nine and a phase of zero. The magnitude of the oscillation is nine volts and the relative phase is zero. For the second one, we get a magnitude of one and a phase of pi. It's 180 degrees out of phase, out of phase with respect to the source that created it. And likewise, the third, the real part's three, the imaginary part's zero, the magnitude is three, and the phase is zero. So again, don't interpret these as DC values. We're talking about microwave engineering. The uh, frequencies are anything but DC. Once we have the solutions for our, one, our uh, unknown wave amplitudes, the four unknown wave amplitudes, we can use those to go back and calculate the voltages and currents at the end of our transmission lines. Remember the uh, voltage, for example, at the beginning of the first transmission line, the total voltage was equal to this. This was the result we got from our boundary condition. Well, gosh, now we know what V0 plus A is and V0 minus A is. We can insert them in there and find that the total voltage at the beginning of that transmission line, that first transmission line, is a value of 16 e to the, e to the plus J pi over 2, a magnitude of 16 and a phase of pi over 2 or 90 degrees, a real part of zero and an imaginary part of 16 in other words <clears throat> same thing for the current at the beginning of the line um, the voltage at the end of the first line and the current at the end of the first line we can do now determine specifically those complex values 
Likewise, for that second transmission line, now that we have the unknown wave amplitudes for the uh, second transmission line, they're no longer unknown, we know what those values are, we can determine the voltage and current at the beginning of that line at z is equal to zero, and likewise the total voltage and current at the end of the line at z is equal to plus lambda over four, and these are those complex values, the magnitude and phase, describing the oscillation, both magnitude and relative phase of that oscillation. Now, why would we want to do this? Other than it's interesting and fun to determine these values, why would we want to find them? The reason that we want to find them is to apply a sanity check. We want to make sure that these voltages and currents on each transmission line on either end satisfy the boundary conditions that we originally set up. If we've done everything algebraically correct, then they will. But if we made a mistake, and of course it's easy to make a mistake when you're dealing with algebra and complex numbers, uh, and so we want to go back and check just to make sure that we've done this correctly. And when we do that, we're happy to know that our boundary condition on number one at z is equal to minus lambda over four, that is satisfied. Boundary condition two and three at the value of z is equal to zero, kvl and kcl, likewise that works out. And finally, boundary condition number four at the end of the line where the load is, it likewise gives us an answer that is self-consistent. So we've gone through and found that um, our results must be um, uh, algebraically or numerically correct. Now, this worked out nicely, and I will admit that uh, the first time I did this, it didn't work out, and I had to re -go, back, re go back and redo my algebra. The second time I did it, it still didn't work, and I had to go back and redo it again. So the third time through, I finally get the right answer, and I wouldn't know that if I had not gone through and applied this Sandy check. So again, it's crucial you can determine whether you got the right answer. That's the great thing about it. If I give you a problem and you want to turn it in, you can determine whether it's correct or not by going back and applying your boundary conditions and a sanity check. If it works out, almost certainly it's correct. If it doesn't, then clearly you've done something wrong. And so it's only a question of you whether you want to make the effort to determine whether the answer that you provide is correct or is not. So we go back and think, well, what are we really after here? What would the problem statement ask for? That was, of course, VL and IL. And the voltage uh, across the load is simply the voltage at the end of the second line at the value of Z is equal to plus lambda over four. And we know that to be equal to this. Likewise, IL is the current at the end of the line at uh, Z is equal to lambda over four. And we calculated it to be this. And so those are our correct answers. So let's go back and think about this. There was a lot of work to go through and apply each of these boundary conditions. We got four equations and four unknowns, and then we had to do the algebra to find the answers. Again, I made the mistake the first time. I had to redo it. I checked again. I still made a mistake. I went to go through it again. Finally, the third time, I did the algebra correctly and got the right answer according to my sanity check. The question might ask yourself, is there an easier way? Generally speaking, there isn't an easier way than simply applying boundary conditions and solving for the unknown complex wave amplitudes. Four equations and four unknowns in this case, the four unknowns being the four complex wave amplitudes, plus and minus for one, for one transmission line, plus and minus V0 for the other. But this circuit, when you looked at it, had inklings of our special cases. Each of those two transmission lines had a length of lambda over four. And because they had lengths of lambda over four, we can apply uh, our special cases to simplify this result. One of the most powerful things in electroengineering is the idea of equivalent circuits, of going through and trying to crush our circuit down into something simpler and evaluate it in each plane. Notice we have three planes there. One at the uh, source, between the source and the first transmission line, a plane between the first transmission line and the second, and finally a plane, a port plane between the second transmission line and the load itself. And what we can do in each of those planes is look right and left and crush the thing down to an equivalent circuit and simplify our analysis. And because we have these special cases, our transmission lines are lambda over four, we're able to go through and do that very quickly. And because of that, we can get the same answers without so much work.